you know, that's that's a really wonderful time of the year to get out and kind of recreate on frozen lakes. And um, but there's really been, I think, sort of a dearth in the literature of of sort of fundamental research when it comes to under ice processes. And for me, it's not even so much sort of necessarily what's happening in winter, but sort of how that influences sort of annual scale processes. Um, so my research program, you know, I think a lot about single lakes, but I, I fundamentally like kind of upscaling those to understand environmental change at a larger scale. Um, and just background on me, my research program is, I think a lot about sort of polar and winter limnology. I also do a lot of work on salinization in lakes, which given it's mostly driven by road salt, uh, has to do with winter. And then do a lot with uh, lake modeling and data science and more and more sort of trying to delve into the machine learning uh, realm. So today, polar winter limnology. So, you know, as limnologists, we think a lot about summer. It's the season of exuberance. Uh, you know, everyone's out having fun. The lakes are blooming. Um, and it's a time when we've historically done a lot of research, you know, given that we don't have to teach or take classes in the summer and we can hire undergrads or summer jobs and get out in the field. It's it's really a pretty convenient time to, to be out sampling. Um, you know, we have buoys out there in summer. They can take data for us autonomously and we can't leave these in in winter. They will get crushed by the ice pack. So, you know, winter presents logistical challenges for humans, but presents logistical challenges for equipment as well. Um, and summer's important. We know lakes are warming. You know, a lot of our uh, kind of biggest climate change related data sets have to do with, with summer. Um, this is an example of uh, one of Houston's papers on warming lake trends globally. Um, and so this is, you know, an, it, obviously important when it comes to lakes. Um, but then we have the, the opposite. We have winter, right? It's in the region we live in, lakes are frozen. But globally, most lakes are frozen as well. Most lakes globally are in temperate to boreal to polar latitudes. They freeze. Um, and so this is a, a season that's globally really relevant, um, but historically just presents challenges for how we've traditionally conducted limnology, which is getting out in the field and, and taking observations. And one of the reasons for that is it's cold and inhospitable, but lake ice can be challenging to work on. Um, and also it's a time of year just for a lot of our schedules, which is, is busier. Um, and then in terms of instrumentation, we've just traditionally not designed instruments to be in sort of ice conditions. So a lot of times we have great summer sampling um, equipment and they, these, you know, these types of buoys all get pulled out in the winter. So the, the implications of that is that we just don't have as much data from winter seasons. So this is a plot that I made a couple of years ago where I just pulled all of the chlorophyll data from the United States National Water Quality Data Portal. So this is for all lakes and reservoirs uh, in the United States between the latitude of 42 and 49 degrees north. And what's very obvious is the lack of data between the months of December and March. Um, you know, I guess this graph even sort of surprised me with how, how few data, data observations were available. Um, and this lack of data really just constrains our ability to develop limnological theories. Um, and at worst, it might sort of perpetuate incorrect notions that nothing's happening. It's easy to say nothing's happening if we don't have any data um, for this time of the year. Um, but we do know some things, and I think there's been a lot of really exciting papers published on winter limnology in the last uh, handful of years. Um, this one by Bernie Yang thought about was is thinking about sort of thermal categorization. So what's happening in stratification and temperature under lake ice. Um, so in this paper, this is a GRL paper, Bernie pulled together um, high frequency temperature data sets from a, a handful of lakes around the United States and Canada. And this is the top is an example from Lake Mendota, so our data in Wisconsin. 
sort of showing under ice temperature. And he developed this theory of, of sort of this cryostratified setup versus cryomictic setup, um, all based on, on lake size and what's happening with convection under ice. So now that we're starting to get high frequency data under ice, we can start developing these theories that are then sort of applicable to a wide gradient of lakes. Um, and this is really important because winter is the fastest warming season. Um, you know, climate change is, is happening, but it's happening the fastest in winter. Um, you know, our, our mean summer temperatures in Southern Wisconsin haven't, haven't increased that much, um, but we've seen sort of significant increases in December, January, February temperatures across the state, the, the most in Northern Wisconsin, and the most uh, at night. So the biggest the biggest climate change overall is sort of warming nighttime temperatures. Um, and then in, in this photo, there's obviously some catastrophic <laughs> consequences to um, warming temperatures in winter. Um, and one of the results of that is that we're seeing less lake ice. Um, so this is data from Lake Mendota, where we're pretty lucky to have one of the longest data sets on lake ice uh, coverage. It goes back into the kind of 1850s, and we can see a historical change from a period of time where we used to have four months of lake ice to a period of time where we really switched to having more like two to three months of lake ice in a winter. Um, and so we're, we're kind of compressing that winter season, both at the tail end and falls, so we're having sort of later freeze ups. And then in the um, spring, we're having earlier thaws. And this is not unique to Lake Mendota. Every lake ice data set globally is sort of showing this trend of decreasing coverage. So again, this is a phenomenon that's sort of globally relevant. We're seeing less lake ice. So what is, you know, the limnological question is sort of, is that important? What's What does that have impacts on ecologically? Um, and so again, there's there's more work being done on this. This is a paper that Gesa um, published this year, uh, pulling together data sets on ice quality. So sort of moving beyond this binary of like, is there ice, is there not ice, to this question of what is the quality of that ice? How much white ice is there versus black ice? The type of ice is really uh, critical in ecological processes. Um, and so this, you know, if you've ever looked at lake ice, um, you know, you can see that it has structure. Uh, this is a video from Crystal Lake in Northern Wisconsin last year. Um, and this is sort of really clear black ice. Um, and in this case, you can see that light is able to, I mean, since we can see through this ice cover, it means that light is really able to penetrate it very easily. Um, and as you get to the surface, you get ice and snow that sort of prevents light from passing through higher light attenuation. Um, and so these have then these sort of trickle down ecological effects on, so, you know, ice is ice is not binary. Um, and this is data from Lake Mendota. So this is, this is the big lake here in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and this lake is big enough that it often gets windswept. So often the snow will sort of blow off of it and we get sort of no snow conditions. So these are these are Sentinel satellite images from 2008 and 2019. The top having no snow, the bottom having full snow cover. So these are both in March. So a time of year when the, you know, the, the days are getting longer and sun angle is pretty high. Um, and what we can see in some limnological data in the lake, so the top graph is under ice light intensity. Um, and in 2018, no snow, you know, much higher light uh, levels. Um, if we look at temperature, 2018 is warmer, you know, maybe getting more solar radiation penetrating through the ice. Um, the, let's see, uh, the dissolved oxygen is higher, likely a result of photosynthesis, um, which has feedbacks on, uh, on pH. Um, sorry, the one, this one that's cut off is chlorophyll. Um, so sort of deeper photic zone, 
bigger extent of sort of the, the habitat that you're getting photosynthesis in. So all because of, in this case, snow depth. And then, you know, this probably has implications for nutrient cycling and potentially what then is available in spring when the ice cover comes off um, and you get these sort of traditional spring phenological events of like a spring phytoplankton bloom um, that sort of carries over to zoopic plankton grazing and, and sets up in the summer. Um, and this data was part of this paper that Emily Cavalier published uh, recently in 2020, uh, where a group of limnologists um, put together this paper on what they coined the, the lake ice continuum concept, thinking about winter being winter conditions being sort of this continuum that depends on surface conditions. So in this case, it was sort of you had a lake that had ice and snow, you had a lake that had clear ice, and then you had a lake that had open water conditions. And that as you had as a lake experiences climactic change, you were likely to shift sort of left to right. You know, lots of snow, thick ice towards less snow, potentially clear ice that allowed more light to come in and then and then open water conditions. And the physics of those three conditions was going to then determine the ecology. So um, if you have no ice, you have wind mixing, you have gas exchange, um, you have ample light, um, depending on the time of year, I guess. Um, if you have ice, you know, that that shuts down a lot of that uh, convective mixing, although it happens, um, less light, so forth. So interesting paper sort of outlining sort of just like theoretically what we think is going to happen. Um, and the, one of the big hypotheses in this paper was that light is the most important driver of under ice processes. So building on this hypothesis, um, Noah Lodding and I decided that we wanted to conduct an experiment in Northern Wisconsin um, where we removed the snow from a lake. Um, basically, you know, most of these concepts or theories and we wanted to, to test that experimentally. Um, and so this, this project was funded by, the, by NSF Ecosystems, um, sort of a small, a small grant. Uh, and we had a lot of help from graduate students um, and technicians on this. Um, but our, our goal was to remove snow from a lake and uh, it sort of experimentally test these theories that light is gonna drive a, this sort of have a bunch of feedbacks on on ecological processes. So we decided to do this um, on South Sparkling Bog, which is a bog lake in northern Wisconsin. Um, it's about half a hectare. Um, it's it is eight meters deep, so it's fairly deep, um, but it has very high DOC. It's a dystrophic lake. Um, you know these type of experiments here limited to what's feasible. Um, and people have done some snow clearing experiments, but they're very short duration. They've, they've gone out and sort of cleared a patch for a couple of weeks. Um, but no one's, that to my knowledge, has done it for an entire season. Um, and it's a, it's a lot of work. Um, so one second. Sorry, we're in the witching hour. Um, so it's a lot, it's just a lot of work to plow an entire lake. Um, and so you are, we anyway, we're, uh, the challenge is to find a system that's relevant that you can actually do this to. So um, we picked South Sun Green Bog because it's uh, very similar in characteristics to Trout Bog Lake, which is one of our long-term study lakes. So Trout Bog, we have, 40 years of data going back. And so we thought it would be a really good sort of reference system to be able to compare our experimental lake to. Um, so this is a you know, picture of South Sparkling Bog. It's a, it's a round bog lake in the middle of a forest, um, has very little sort of human influence. Um, and we had a game cam out and uh, had, some, had some furry visitors in the winter, which was pretty fun to watch. Um, Okay, so to give you a sense of this experiment, um, in 2018, we 
did some sampling of characteristics, but we didn't touch the um, the snow or ice. So that was 2018 was our reference year. Um, and then in 2019, 2020, and then 2020, 21, we plowed the lake. Um, you all know that half of this time was a global pandemic. Um, so there's, uh, you know, a big shout out to our technicians and a couple of grad students who really like kept this research going under very uh, challenging protocols for what we could and could not do. So um, I say, you know, we got, it was a sort of amazing what got done um, despite some of the challenges during this time period. Um, so part of that was Noah and Paul and who went out and did this every time it snowed. Um, you can see from this the sun in this, you know, throughout this video that this took, uh, you know, many hours of work. Um, and I think they had some fun, but hopefully not too much. So this was our plowing. Um, the years were, in terms of actual snowfall, you know, pretty similar. The Northwoods gets uh, a lot of a lot of snow. Um, so each year had over a meter of snow, but there was a, a major difference between 2020 and 2021 that had a significant impact on our outcomes of the study. Um, so in 2020, the lakes froze during a big snowstorm. And so there was a lot of snow falling that froze into this sort of big slushy mess. And so by the time that we could get safely onto the ice, all of the ice was this sort of big conglomerate of white ice. Um, in 2021, the opposite happened. The lakes froze during this really calm period with no snow. And so they we got this sort of incredibly clear black ice um, that were almost, you know, with perfect conditions. Everyone was out skating. Um, so that that initial setup of ice, even though we plowed in 2020 and 2021, the initial ice was very, very different on this on this lake. And then in terms of air temperatures, you know, which was which was cold, uh, it was below freezing until kind of late March. Um, and then the dashed lines on this graph on the right are the ice updates. So ice came off in April, all three years. Um, so that ice quality had a big difference. So the picture on the left is the ice in 2020. Um, this is sort of this bad freeze where we had a lot of white ice, whereas in 2021, we had the solid freeze and, and really clear black ice. Um, so this is the ice thickness data from the years. And the bottom, the top is so sparkling bogs or our experimental lake. The bottom is trout bog. Um, so we were we were effective in removing snow. Uh, so very little snow in our ex on ex our experimental plowed years. Um, we also got thicker ice. So you remove that insulated snow cover, you, the ice thickens. Um, so our our lake had a lot thicker ice than our reference lake, Trout Bog. Um, whereas they were very similar in our reference year. So this is us out in the field. Um, we took, this is uh, this is like a contraption to measure under ice light. So we have a PAR sensor um, on a boom that sort of cantilevers out under the ice so that you can, you that so your, your data is not impacted by the fact that you just drilled a hole. Um, so this is us uh, taking light measurements um, and Ellie setting up a pump to pump water uh, up for some uh, geochemistry. Um, so let's talk about light. So the whole goal here, the hypothesis is about light. So we wanted to in, we want, we wanted to increase light. Um, so we had we took manual par measurements. Um, then we also had a buoy in the lake that had hobo pendant light sensors that measure light intensity. Um, so this is the top is a scatter plot sort of comparing the buoy data light intensity to our manual data par. Um, these are very low light conditions. So these par values are extremely, extremely low. Um, but we had a, you know, I'd say a very good fit uh, between our measurements. Um, and so we converted our buoy data 
to par to make it um, more ecologically relevant than light intensity. Um, and you could see in panel B the par data. Um, essentially, in 2019, we couldn't, we just like couldn't measure any light under the ice. Um, 2020, there was just a little bit, um, and then in 2021. Uh, we at least could routinely measure par, although it was still very low. These dashed lines are some literature values of par values. Um, that is the threshold for photosynthesis and the threshold for biomass accumulation. So we're like still at that threshold of like, is this even enough light for photosynthesis? Um, even though we sort of significantly increased it. Um, the bottom graph is dissolved oxygen. So we were really interested in oxygen because this hypothesis, you can increase light, you increase primary productivity, which one of the ways to measure that is through the oxygen uh, production. And manual readings of dissolved oxygen are, are hard in the surface because you've sort of just drilled a hole, you've, you have sort of atmospheric exchange. Um, so it's hard to be you, it's hard to be confident in your oxygen reading at the surface when you've sort of just drilled this hole and introduced oxygen. Um, so we had an oxygen sensor on a buoy, um, and our buoy sort of uh, distal to our sampling holes. Um, and we just couldn't, <laughs> we didn't measure any dissolved oxygen. Um, it was zero for most of the winter until in March when we started getting a lot of light. Uh, and so we think that, you know, this is indicative of sort of uh, a lot of photosynthesis. We think that there's probably photosynthesis happening before this, but this, these lakes are just so productive that like any oxygen that's created is sort of immediately used up. Um, temperatures um, were different between years. I'm actually not going to talk too much about temperature. We're hoping to do sort of more thorough temperature analysis, but um, you remove snow and the lakes get colder. Um, basically, you're removing that insulatory snow on top. Um, and so the, the temperature decline is, is much faster until you start getting a lot of solar radiation penetrating through the ice cover. And then those surface temperatures increase. Um, and we're hopefully going to be working on that in the new year. Um, but yeah, dissolved oxygen. We think it's there, we think it's just being used too quickly. And it's another problem with these lakes where the ox, the oxic layer is very shallow is when you have a buoy, you, it, it's challenging to have your buoy right below the ice surface because your ice is really thickening and you don't want your sensor being frozen into the ice. So it's, again, comes down to these logistical challenges of like, how do you measure oxygen right under the ice? Um, and dystrophic lakes are known for Kind of microbial oxygen consumption. This was a, a it's a great paper, Ashley Shade, which was a PhD student. Um, they experimentally mixed a, a bot, a North, they mixed North sparkling bog. Um, and this, this uh, figure is from their paper showing dissolved oxygen. Um, but basically the one on the left D, um, in July, they experimentally mixed the lake. They were able to get oxygen through the whole water column and then sort of immediately it was used up. Like there's just so much microbial activity that any oxygen they put in was just gone within days. Um, so, you know, that's, if you were to do this in a ligotrophic lake, you'd, you'd probably see different results. Um, but the water was green. Like it was significantly different in our second manipulation year. Um, our chlorophyll concentrations went up. They were much higher than our reference lake. You can even see that in this photo. Um, so, you know, we have confidence that we have photosynthesis. Um, and so we saw this relationship that we expected, which was that PAR was related to ice. Um, and that you know, there was basically, if you had less snow and white ice, you, you were able to penetrate light into the water column. Um, we also had Secchi depth and it was maybe counterintuitively um, not related to 
light, but it, you know, SECI is a measurement of the light attenuation in the water column. And so in those, in that last year when we had more productivity, SECI depth went down, we think, because we had more productivity. Um, our phytoplankton community composition changed a lot. Well, first of all, the biomass increased. Um, so we had a significant increase in bio volume um, during the years. And we, we switched from a community that was sort of mixed between small cyanobacteria and mixotrophs, some chlorophytes, to a community that was dominated by chlorophytes. So that's indicative of more light. Um, this, and this is something that has feedbacks on, you know, up through the food web. Chlorophytes are sort of known as a great food source for zooplankton. Um, so, though, you know, we changed the phytoplankton community composition uh, between these years. Um, Ellie was a master's student on this project. She spent a lot of time counting zooplankton. Um, and saw a pretty a very big change in the zooplankton community. Um, in the in the first two years, there was virtually no zooplankton in the winter. Um, and these are bog lakes that we, you know, there are zooplankton in the summer. Um, almost entirely rotifers. Um, and so again, this is different than an oligotrophic lake where you tend to have, you know, you you have, you do have sort of cladocera and copepods in the winter. Um, and in this case, what was interesting was even though we saw more phytoplankton in year two, we didn't see more zooplankton in year two. It wasn't until year three where we, you know, we had a lot of phytoplankton and presumably more oxygen. So our hypothesis on this data is that this might, we, that our zooplankton population might have been constrained by oxygen availability rather than food source potentially. Um, so we, to dig into that, we actually drew on some of the data from trout bogs. That's the reference lake where we have 40 years of data. Um, and trout bog has been getting browner over some of this time period. Um, and what we're seeing in trout bog is the dissolved oxygen concentration in winter has is much lower now than it used to be. Um, so this is a time series of under ice data in trout bog since 1980. And the bottom graph is sort of the, the minimum dissolved oxygen measured in the winter. Um, and we can see that in those early years, it was often saturated at the surface. Um, and sort of in the last two decades, there's just been really low surface oxygen concentrations under ice. Um, and the zooplankton density is the top graph. Um, and, you know, they're, they match up pretty well. Um, we see that there's, very, you know, there's, there's much lower zooplankton densities in the last two decades. So, you know, we think that this fits our hypothesis that, you know, if you just don't have oxygen, you can't have these organisms uh, surviving throughout the winter. Um, so that was, that's our, that's our work hypothesis at the moment. Um, so sort of to relate phytoplankton and zooplankton communities uh, together, we saw that we had this switch towards chlorophytes in the winter uh, driven by light. So these are uh, RDA plots for phytoplankton uh, and CCA plots for zooplankton. Um, but, you know, just a, a statistical representation of kind of the, the findings that we saw, which was that light is sort of driving the change in community composition. Um, so to kind of sum up the experimental findings here, you know, we removed the snow cover and in doing so changed ice characteristics. You remove the snow cover, you inherently have less white ice because you're not really getting ice formation from snow. Um, and so you increase black ice thickness, um, but those characteristics are really uh, driven at initially by like that initial freeze up. So even though, you know, we did the same thing in year two and three, we had fundamentally different ice characteristics based on that like first week of freezing. Um, and so 
you know, the snow is important, but sort of that ice quality is really important as well. Um, goes back to sort of Gase's uh, argument that, you know, ice, I, we should be thinking about ice quality more than sort of this binary of ice or no ice. Um, so when you, you know, if you are able to get light penetrating into the water column, have more productivity, um, changed phytoplankton community composition, changed zooplankton community composition. Um, and, you know, we have, we don't really have higher, we don't really have large fish species. So this is sort of as high as you go in these lakes. Um, we also um, measured greenhouse gas concentrations. So Adriana Gorski was a master student in this project. Um, and we had predicted that if we could change oxygen dynamics, we could change, you know, methanogenesis, methanotrophic dynamics. Um, but we weren't we weren't really able to change dissolved oxygen concentrations. They they stayed very low. Um, so we didn't have all that much variation between years. So we weren't really able to test that hypothesis that you know we could we could change methane oxidation. Um, thinking that you know more oxidation would mean less emissions. But you know overall our our years were were similar. Um, but we were fortunate to team up with some atmospheric scientists here. Um, and so the picture on the left is actually a, an eddy covariance flux tower that we, we left on the ice and allowed to, as the ice melted, just like sink and float as like a floating eddy covariance tower. Um, so this was, uh, there's a lot, you know, I had some trepidation as the lead PI on this project. Um, that methane sensor is like $40,000, but uh, it all went according to plan. Other than these are very power hungry instruments and it's very challenging to power these instruments in the winter when you just like solar, solar power is not good enough. Um, so there was a lot of switching batteries uh, and we couldn't really keep the instrument on 24 hours a day. So we were sort of prioritizing daytime hours. Um, and then, you know, numer you know, the analysis side, like this thing's, once the ice starts going out, you know, this thing's moving around. So you also have the challenge of a, a moving tower. Um, but the data was pretty cool. This is uh, data from Adriana's um, JGR paper, but the, I guess the bottom, bo the, bo the bottom panel is the most interesting methane flux where the, you know, once the lake ice sort of disappeared in late April, kind of got this pulse of methane. So the 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 idea that you have sort of methane building up in the water column, usually near the bottom, and then when the lake ice comes off, you have sort of some spring mixing that sort of allows like the lake to sort of burp out greenhouse gases. Um, so we're able to sort of capture that. Um, and there's been a handful of studies that have managed to do this, but again, this is, you know, logistically very challenging. And part of that is just cost. Methane sensors are extremely expensive, but then it's, you know, how do you, how do you actually pull off being able to measure that data? So that was, yeah, that was exciting um, to be able to do that. Um, so yeah, our, our findings overall, you know, some of these are, are intuitive, but hadn't really been experimentally tested over entire seasons, um, you know, less snow, more light, but again, it's kind of crucial on your ice quality. Um, we actually initially thought that if we had more light, we'd, it would be warmer, we'd have more just, you know, solar radiation, um, but uh, we were wrong, it was colder. Uh, so the insula, you know, that, that insulatory property of snow outweighed any additional radiation. Um, and that, yes, phytoplankton responded instantly, but zooplankton sort of lagged behind depending on, I mean, we think oxygen. Okay, so uh, that was our experimental snow removal. Um, I think like, the big question of what's next is really thinking about what the, how these conditions sort of carry over to spring. So, you know, if, if there is a snowy winter, if there is an open water winter, 
does that have sort of, we use the term ecological memory a lot, but does this have this memory effect on Im impacting uh, spring or, or summer conditions? So, you know, can you, can these winter conditions sort of shape your upcoming seasons? Because if they, if they do, then that's even more important to be studying sort of those changing, uh, changing winter conditions. If winter is sort of irrelevant when it comes to the annual scale, um, then less important. Um, and, you know, the work that's been done on this is, is minimal. Um, and I think evidence points to it matters in some lakes and it doesn't matter in others. Um, so, you know, Jay, you're probably the perfect person to talk about Lake Superior, like these big lakes have this sort of long, you know, they have this really slow inertia. And so you do have these sort of carryover effects of a really low ice winter versus a high ice winter. Um, but, you know, is that the same in a small lake? And we see that in Northern Wisconsin, there's carryover effect because essentially we don't have spring. Ice comes off our lakes so late, sometimes in May, that winter abuts summer. And so we just don't have time for spring conditions to sort of have an impact. So in that case, yes, ice, like ice, ice off dates definitely impact summer. Um, but in Southern Wisconsin, ice comes off in March and we have a sort of long spring where the lakes are mixing and they almost kind of reset. Um, and we, so we don't seem to have as much of sort of this carryover. Um, so sort of some interesting sort of seasonal to seasonal dynamics. Um, but I think there's some, I think there's lots of sort of interesting questions to be asked when it comes to sort of seasonality. Um, so yeah, so this, this graph is um, kind of what I just said, which was um, in, this is a graph, a scatter plot of ice off date versus date of stratification across seven lakes. Um, sorry, across eight lakes. The six on the left are in Northern Wisconsin and the two on the right are in Southern Wisconsin. And what we see is that, you know, in Northern Wisconsin, very strong correlation between when ice comes off the lake, when it stratifies, stratification has, is very important. Um, whereas in Southern Wisconsin, there's just no relationship because we have this kind of long spring. Um, and, you know, if you think about the future, well, Northern Wisconsin is just gonna become more like Southern Wisconsin. Um, and then thinking about spring, you know, spring is this time where we have a lot of sort of biology ramping up. Um, and so we see these sort of normal phenological progressions of phytoplankton bloom, zooplankton boom, the grazers, fish are spawning. Um, and so, you know, do, do are these trophic responses in the spring impacted by sort of those ice conditions and then even more like the whole sort of biology and chemistry that's been going on in winter. So um, Zach Fine already wrote a nice paper on this sort of the perspective of some of these ecological and evolutionary consequences of what a sort of winter variability might mean. Um, but again, perspective, a lot of these theories that people are tossing around have not been tested. Um, and so this, Thinks about the ecology, but also evolution. Thinking of whoops, thinking about you know, as you have winter climate change, you might have directional pressures. But what we're what we're actually seeing in northern Wisconsin is not necessarily this directional pressure of like warm, like earlier ice off. We're actually seeing this huge variability where some years ice comes off in like one year came off in March, and then the next year came off in May, and so you have these sort of two year you know, two month swings in variability. What does that then mean for the lake itself? Okay, so I wanna end on this quote from Steve Carpenter that I love, which is that ecosystems will always surprise you. Um, I think, you know, as budding scientists, uh, maybe ecosystem ecologists, um, you know, there's a lot that we've done, but there's a lot that we really haven't looked at. And I think, you know, you should go out and let ecosystems surprise you and uh, sort of maybe test some of your assumptions of what you think kind of might be happening out there. Um, so just to wrap up, um, this was funded by NSF. Uh, we use a lot of NTL, LTR data. Um, this is 
also supported by the University of Wisconsin, who's invested a lot of uh, money in our field station, which has really good um, winter support. So we run a, a full year field program. Um, a lot of field stations shut down in the winter. So we have um, all of the equipment you need for winter sampling. Um, so if anyone's ever sort of interested in um, getting out on some smaller lakes in winter, um, we're, you know, I'd be happy to talk. Um, it's a couple hours, couple hours from Duluth. So uh, it's pretty close actually. So um, yeah, and with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions. Great. So, <laughs> thank you so much. I'll open the floor up to questions from students. Hi, I'm Mark. I'm not there. I usually am, but I'm not. <laughs> so, and my camera's not working, but um, so I study yellow perch and winter ecology. And so, cool. yeah. Um, just a couple like sampling questions. I'm actually going out next week and sampling light oxygen, chlorophyll, stuff like that, if everything mm -hmm. works out. Anyways, um, when you measure light, do you just stick it straight down the hole and don't like cover it up at all? Or do you have like a like a black blanket or some sort of styrofoam you stick on top of the oxygen? Yeah. I mean, so, uh, temperature meter. Right. Yeah. Some people definitely use like the I I done sampling where we use like the black blanket technique. Um, we have this um, kind of L-shaped boom where we uh, it sort of folds up. So we put it through the ice, and then sort of the the boom sort of cantilevers out. So the PAR sensor is like a meter and a half away from the hole, um, and you know through we've used this method for decades, but um, you know, tested it and far enough away that it's not impacted by your 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 other dice hole. Um, it's not the easiest contraption, um, but that's what we use um, in terms of like trying to have your yeah data not impacted by your sampling hole. Um, but yeah, certainly see people do it like inside a fishing pop up tent with a blanket. Um, but you know, you also don't. Like, it, you know, if you're sampling right under that blanket, that would also be impacting your light. So we find this this method to at least, we think, be the most representative of um, the under ice environments. And then in this case, we backed it up with having light sensors like far away from our sampling holes. Cool. Uh, another quick question I have is, has climate change impacted the ice on dates as well because I know the ice off dates you said are really variable from yeah. year to year. Yes. For the most part they're getting later. Um we haven't they're in southern Wisconsin they are getting later. Um so I'm watching my dog like chew up a toy one sec. Hey come here. Come here. Come here. Come inside. Um, I actually have not looked at the variability of ice on. Um, I, my gut, which I should test analytically, is that they, the variability is not as big because what's happening with ice off is that winter, we're either having these winters where we have like a polar vortex event where it's just so cold and winter lasts so long, or we don't and we have these sort of mild winters where the ice comes off in March. Um, whereas in the fall, we're like we're not having those like huge variable sort of jet stream climate drivers. But uh yeah, I haven't run the variability in the in the fall. But we, we're not seeing in northern Wisconsin, we haven't seen a, a a significant change in duration as much as spring variability. But northern Wisconsin has like southern Wisconsin and northern Wisconsin have very sort of different climates too. So different ice dynamics. And you know, we don't have you guys all have those sort of moderating climate impact of Lake Superior, and we just don't down here. Cool. Thanks. That really helps. 
I, I'm not sure it helped that much, but you're welcome. <laughs> so here in the room, uh, Daniel. Question for you. What influenced your decision to pick a dystrophic lake for your ice snow clearing experiment when, for example, ecological variables that change it there might be more visible in the eutrophic or even the oligotrophic lake? Yeah. Perfect question. Um, like what was what was possible was what drove us to choose a dystrophic lake. So we had to choose a lake that was convenient enough that we could access and do this to that wouldn't be impacting other people, other, you know, we had to, it had to have minimal impact. We had to be able to do it. So there was nothing in Southern Wisconsin that like was logistically feasible. Also our winters down here are just like not, they're not predictable enough to be able to pull this off. Um, whereas in Northern Wisconsin, we like, we know we're gonna have four months of lake ice. Um, and so the lakes around our field station, we sort of have big oligotrophic lakes and we have small dystrophic lakes. And so to be able to find a lake that we like feasibly could plow the entire thing, um, it was a dystrophic lake. Um, and we wanted to have a reference system where we had comparable data. So that sort of, that was what was possible. Um, we certainly would have loved to do this or do this in the oligotrophic lake, because you're right, I mean, the habitat's so different. Um, but we don't, you know, the, of the lakes that we study are, they just, the our oligotrophic ones are just like too big. Um, it's just, it's shut. This, this bog lake was so small and it still took so much effort to remove snow. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so with the increase in productivity that you saw with the snow removal and the clear ice here, um, how long did that productivity boom kind of last and did that have an effect uh, like further into the year throughout the whole open water season? Yeah, so we didn't, um, so we did have, we put, we put chlorophyll sensors in the lakes. Um, they didn't, they didn't really work. Um, so we weren't able to kind of get high frequency chlorophyll data. Um, and then there's, you know, this question of how relatable is chlorophyll to actual phytoplankton biomass. It's known that in the winter phytoplankton like really ramp up their pigments because of the low light environment. So, you know, one unit of chlorophyll in the winter is much different than sort of one unit of chlorophyll in the summer. So even that biomass relationship is really tricky. Um, and then phytoplankton biomass requires a lot of effort. <laughs> um, so we weren't, you know, I don't have a good answer to your question. Um, these lakes are so productive that it probably didn't have too much of a, I mean, my guess is it didn't have much of a carryover effect at all. Um, but I would be interested in a, in a lake that might be more nutrient limited where, you know, if you do have earlier phytoplankton blooms, you actually kind of use up that nutrient allotment. Um, and then your maybe like your spring phytoplankton bloom wouldn't be as big. I don't know. A question about your reference here when you left the snow on. And I was wondering, what was that a white ice year, a black ice year? Did you look at, and how much do you think the ice? And that year contributed to the attenuation. Yeah, so it was kind of half and half white and black, um, more white than our first plow year. Um, you know, I think most most of these point to like you have ten centimeters of snow and you've blocked all the all the light. Um, so it doesn't sort of it doesn't take much snow to to really attenuate all of the light. So I'm not. I'm not convinced that our the white ice would have that white ice black ice proportion would have necessarily had an influence if you have that much snow. Um, and there's you know a handful of studies have sort of measured that, but again, um, there there could be more. Like we we still don't have like a really awesome grasp on light attenuation and and snow and then yeah white white and black ice and. Um, you know, even though I've made this case that it's like 
it's not binary like white and black guys aren't binary either you know it's a there's different different conditions of white eyes other student questions um if there are no other questions from students um hillary thanks again for a really enlightening talk no thanks yeah thanks Jay. it's been it's been fun to give this one it's it's good to give it to people who live in a wintry place so next time you guys are out on lake guys you know check out the ice and we'll make sure to we'll make sure to next time you pass through the loop make sure to stop and say hi um yeah if, yeah especially if there's some white fish sandwiches involved I'll, i'm there there we go and make sure you bring your dogs they and, would love to come they do not enjoy the eutrophic lakes in southern wisconsin so gotcha. yeah great <laughs> thanks, thanks again All right. yeah thank you yep.